Hey everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, we will get started in a couple of minutes. So uh, while we're waiting, feel free to drop your name and where you're joining from in the chat. Oh no, the chat is disabled, hold on. All right, should be fixed now, sorry about that. All right, I still see some people trickling in. So yeah, let's drop our name and where we're joining from the chat. Hey, Sarah Beth from Arizona. Jackie from Florida. JB from Colorado. Hey, JB. Oh, wow, from Chile. Seattle, Boston. Ireland, Raleigh, nice. Well, we have folks from all over. I love this. Okay, so I know we'll have some people trickling in, but I, in the sake of for the sake of time, I want to go ahead and get started. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Demebi Igbuna. I'm one of the co-founders of Chezzy. Uh, for those who don't know, Chezzy is an ERG management software. But in addition to that, we like to uh, give resources and support to those who are leading the charge uh, for employee resource groups. Uh, so with that being said, we are hosting this webinar on Thursday, April 18th. Um, this is around the National Stress Awareness Month, which happens every year in April. Um, and we're joined by Ashley Mann Lofthouse, who was previously the Global DEI Manager at Kraft Heinz um, and is now the President and CEO of Core Collective. Um, she's also a mental health expert, expert, so I thought she would be the perfect person to talk to us around uh, strategies for understanding and managing ERG leader stress and burnout. Um, so with that being said, I will pass it over to Ashley. Um, and she's going to take us through a presentation, and then we'll also do a Q&A at the end. So as she's um, presenting to us, feel free to drop questions in the chat, and then we'll address those at the end. Uh, so Ashley, I'll let you take it over. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Ashley Mann Lofthouse. My pronouns are she and her, and I am a white presenting woman with long, dark hair wearing a green shirt and a blue blazer. I am a member of the Remipo Lenape Nation, and I'm the president and CEO of CORE Collective, which stands for Cultural Outreach and Racial Equity Collective. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that supports underserved communities and educates organizations on how to do the same. As a organizational anthropologist, psychologist and DEI practitioner, I actually began my career in mental health and education, and these spaces couldn't be more intertwined. So I'm thrilled to chat with you today to talk a little bit more about how you can both understand and manage your stress as an ERG leader or ERG program manager. Mm -hmm. So each year, the National Institute of Health recognizes National Stress Awareness Month, bringing attention to all of the negative impacts that stress can have on one's well-being. So what does this look like for an ERG leader? Considering the unique stressors that we have when we face holding two very important roles at work, but also balancing life at home and your physical and mental health. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about these unique stressors. Then we're going to explore some strategies to assess the current practices and then reset using practical tools and techniques that you can effectively manage to understand and combat stress and overwhelm. 
So while everyone experiences stress at work, underserved and undersupported, underrepresented and historically marginalized communities and populations tend to have added levels of pressure for a variety of different reasons due to the barriers that they face, a lack of representation of leadership and conflicting norms. When we think about the cultural norms, the gender norms and things that we have that are expected of us and more. So to add to this challenge, human service employees are actually at a higher risk for experiencing burnout. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, burnout is a syndrome that we experience resulting from workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. So this is characterized by three or more characteristics when we think about the dimensions of stress. That can be feeling uh, energy depletion. You can be exhausted. You can have extreme chronic fatigue. You can have extreme increased mental separation from work or from your job where you're really just feeling disconnected from what it is that you're doing and feelings of cynicism related to work where you just don't want to be there. Now you're having this animosity towards the place that you spend the majority of your time. One of the biggest things that we see when it comes to feeling burnout and stress at work is a reduced professional efficacy. So you're not producing your best work. You're maybe putting things off. You're procrastinating and it, it can be a challenge. Challenge, especially when you think about the confidence that a lot of us in underrepresented communities feel when it comes to imposter syndrome. So did you know that ERG leaders are human service professionals? The field of human services or HR focuses on providing services and supports to individuals in need. And that's exactly what you're doing as an ERG leader. Not only are you playing the role of your full-time job in whatever field that might be, but you're balancing being an HR leader too. You're providing support, resources, education, all of these things to people in your community, but you're also having to teach and coach folks that are outside of your community. So you might have potentially hundreds or even thousands of folks in your community or an ally that you're serving as a learning and development professional, an HR leader, an event planner, a communication specialist, and of course, yourself as a person. How are you experiencing your life at home, the things that you experience from your community at work? And that's where this weight can really, really build to impact you negatively. So what's the impact? When you're feeling burned out, stressed and overloaded, it is impossible to be your best self. We tend to self-seclude. Sometimes we bury ourselves further in work and we might even uh, procrastinate, right? We're not going to get things done. We're gonna put them off to the last minute. We might have avoidance behaviors as well. But some of the most, uh, uh, excuse me, the more uh, serious effects are the challenges that you might experience with interpersonal relationships, a physical manifestation of that stress and mental health concerns as well. In fact, someone who has never experienced anxiety, depression, chronic pain, or extreme fatigue can develop all of these diagnoses and more. Many people who experience this extreme amount of stress can develop disabilities that are debilitating in how they function, both at work and at home. So another thing that I want you to consider when we think about the impact that this can have on your ERGs, right? This excessive stress impacts the people you serve as well. So when you're unmotivated, you're not focused, you are really just crabby, right? We often let stuff slide. We don't produce our best work. We don't provide the best care. And we can't come to a situation with an open mind for understanding. So when we think about the feedback that we're getting or the way that we're taking on somebody else's stress, we're ultimately being, we're, this is being felt by your entire community and you might not even realize it. So why does this happen? Specifically, to ERG leaders, right? I'm sure all of you could list the reasons that you've experienced firsthand, but some of the most common um, and universal experiences are being overloaded at work, which in this space that we're in right now, 
overworking is kind of the norm, right? Like they want us to have this 10, 12 hour day and that's just your main job. But thinking about your responsibilities as an ERG leader and the commitments that you've made as traditionally excluded employees, thinking about the microaggressions we experience, the lack of understanding and the purpose that we have. We tend to be overwhelmed and overextend ourselves to kind of be that helping hand, but also prove our worth, right? So that leads to a lack of understanding of what the purpose of our ERGs even have. Having a lack of visibility to what we are here to serve for the organization and the community's experience internally can really put a toll on us as leaders in being able to do the work. The leaders of the company, when they don't understand, that's where we see this lack of empathy from the leadership. They cannot put themselves in our shoes because they haven't experienced the things that we've experienced. So sometimes we don't get the buy-in that we need, the support and the resources when we think about holistic organizational commitment to our ERG and the community as a whole, which again, not only affects you as an ERG leader, but your entire community can feel that tension between the organization's leadership and their community. So how can we mitigate that? So how do we fix it? Let's assess where we're at. Okay. First and foremost, we need clarity. We need to know what is expected of us. Why did your organization commit to developing ERGs? A lot of times, especially since 2020, it's been a thing that people just feel like they have to do, right? When we think about where the state of DEI is right now, it's something that was so big for a moment that now it's starting to fizzle out. So is this something that your organization is truly committed to and is it for the right reasons? We need to know the clarity of what it is we're intended to deliver. We need transparency to the organization's goals to understand our role, but also being able to have that visibility, it alleviates the stress of the unknown. It gives us the feeling that not only do we know what we're doing, but what we're doing is going to make a difference, not just for our community, but for the whole organization. The clarity can help us define KPIs and metrics that we're going to build into our programming and prove the ROI and the value of this community, but the ERG itself. What we're doing is going to get those leaders to understand, like we talked about just a second ago. To achieve this, we need partnership partnership from the leadership specifically. This is where an executive sponsor can really play a role. They have visibility to things that we just simply do not have visibility to, right? We don't get to know a lot of the things that are happening behind the scenes for our organizations, but having that executive sponsor give us this sneak peek into what it is that's happening behind the scenes at that very top level gives us more understanding of what it is they want from us, what's expected from us and how we can achieve it. One of the things about executive sponsors though is they're not just a face of the BRG or the community, right? They have to influence their partners, their peers and the executive leadership to get us the support that we need. So when I say support, of course we need business support in general, right? But we need dedicated resources, we need funding, we need integral support from our stakeholders. This means you need to connect with folks from every area of the organization, and that will help you identify mutually beneficial supports so that you're not just handling all of this on your own. This will aid you in feeling less overwhelmed, but also give your allies the empowerment that they need to know that they have a responsibility to your community as well, that this is not something that we as underrepresented people are responsible for teaching and coaching and learning. Our responsibility is helping them understand and supporting our community, but they have a greater responsibility in making this happen across the business in every aspect of what it is that we do. So to achieve this, you need to develop a sustainable, holistic plan. And that's where resetting comes into play. Thinking about the elements that we just discussed are all very important, right? But a plan is going to be your best friend. 
the first steps that we need to think about are the strategy. A lot of times when an ERG or a BRG is developed, we don't have a clear strategy. We don't have a direction or a North Star that helps us identify where we're going. So we need to think about where we are now. Where are we sitting? Why were we developed? But where do we want to go and who do we want to be? Do we have goals that we've identified to say, this is where we're sitting, but this is where we expect to be in the future. And this is why being able to articulate that is going to be very impactful, not only for your community members, for yourself and your partners, but for the leadership in the organization to continue getting us that support and the buy-in that we need. We also need to know who can help us get there and the role that they play. This is where that support comes into play when we think about leadership support, executive leader support, and stakeholder support. Who is the person that controls this space? And who is the person that makes the decisions? If we understand who we need to have on our side and how they can achieve those things by identifying their role, then we're going to have so much lifted off of our shoulders because we have partners now. It's not just this group of leaders that is part of this community, again, taking on all of this responsibility, but now everybody plays a role in how we're moving forward. It's gonna take some time to figure these things out, but the key questions are really knowing how to create your plan. So the plan, we need to think about sustainable, consistent processes. And with that comes a lot of advanced work. We wanna think about process and procedure. We wanna think about execution and ownership of what it is that we're doing. So a lot of times that can come from a platform like Chessy, that can come from project tracking and timeline identification. And process and procedure is something that a lot of organizations do very well at, but some really don't have a playbook or a handbook that says, if you were to leave today, can somebody take this on and be able to move forward and be successful? And that's where you can lean on some of these resources and supports to develop a process and procedure. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be a Word document or a PDF, a one pager that you've created to say, this is how we execute program planning. This is how we execute a learning and develop an event. This is how we do an in-person event compared to a virtual or a hybrid event. Being able to track your processes and procedures not only helps you move with efficiency, it helps you move a little faster, but it gives you that consistency in what you're producing so that your entire team, your entire community, and the organization sees that you know what you're doing. We know that you know what you're doing, but when you're overwhelmed, you're stressed, you, you become unmotivated. So you might not be able to put your best foot forward in execution. And that can be seen. We can all tell that something's not right with someone that is so passionate that they took on a second role as an ERG leader. So being able to just pull a process from your repository and say, this is how we execute, let's move forward. A second step of that is the timelining. It is important to identify with your stakeholders, your partners, your leaders, all of the people that are involved with making this a reality, having a timeline. Who needs to know when? Who has to approve by this time? Especially when we think about communications, right? Traditionally, we give our communications to another um another section of the business, right? And they're the ones that release them. So for that, they need a process of approval. They might have to translate to different languages. So when do they need to have that in advance? Because if we're working up until the last minute because we had too much on our plate, we were overwhelmed, this is not the top of my to-do list, they are now behind. And now they have attention towards us. So how do we work with our stakeholders? Let's put together a timeline. We need to be proactive in our planning. We need to sit down once a year and identify everything that we want to do. 
Okay. This is something that uh, I recently was able to enact with Kraft Heinz uh, BRGs, and it was a lot of work. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is a lot of work to be able to say, what is our strategy? What do we want to achieve? How are we going to measure it and track it? But putting together an entire calendar of events and saying, we're going to plan this proactively and in advance so that our stakeholders have awareness. The people we expect to be there or to help Help us because they have a responsibility, we can give them this visibility well in advance so that we can be successful and we're not feeling overwhelmed and stressed because they know what they're supposed to do. We also want to think about that stakeholder management. How are we communicating with them? What are their needs? What are our needs and how do we work together? I think that stakeholder management is something that can cause an extreme amount of stress on an ERG leader. A lot of the times it's because the folks that we're working with don't necessarily understand their role or they don't understand the importance of their role. They might think like, okay, I'm just pushing out this communication. Again, it's not in the top of their to-do list because it doesn't necessarily affect them right? So that's where we work with our stakeholders to give them that clarity and visibility so that they can feel empowered in what they're doing by supporting us. This isn't something that we just expect them to help us with. This is something we want them to understand fully so that they can help us because they feel it. This is something that comes from the understanding of empathy and the understanding of your community. And a lot of times people don't have that lived experience, so they might not get it and that's okay. But you as an ERG leader and as a person from a underrepresented community or as an ally from one of those communities, it is your responsibility to an extent to help people learn. Now, it is not your full responsibility to, to do this. That happens a lot, right? We tend to be the one that has to do all the work for our communities. But if we do just that little piece in the beginning to, to, to share our story, to help people that want to understand understand, you're going to get more buy-in, more commitment, and a true feeling of empowerment from your stakeholders. Like I mentioned earlier, the R&R, the roles and responsibilities is very important because this is another added level of stress for ERG leaders. And it comes from the misunderstanding of whose responsibility it is when we think of things that we are relying on other people for. For example, if we're working with our talent attraction or talent and recruitment teams on making sure that we have a diverse pipeline and that we're reaching the right folks from the right community in the right spaces at the right time. It is their profession, right? They are the subject matter experts, but they might not have the lived experiences to truly understand the perspective that we need them to have to do this the right way. And that's where we can play the role of advisory, of support, and a thought partner through what it is we're trying to achieve. Same thing goes when we think about um, trainings, like bias trainings or um, inclusion trainings. When we're thinking about how we execute with this visibility of the lens of perspective and the reality from our own communities, it's not necessarily our job to create the learning and development opportunities for the organization, right? but it can be our role to serve as a partner to our L&D teams to help them along the way. And that's where different things like a RACI or understanding roles and responsibilities and actually having them documented, like this is what we do with this team and this is what we do with this team. So identifying ownership and partnership collectively, not us as ERG leaders just saying, this is what I want you to do, but working with them holistically as a partner partner to say, this is what I would love to help you with. How can I support? So that they know this is their job. They have to do this, but they can lean on us for some of these things and vice versa. Again, going back to the communications team, we need them, but they also need us. So how can we identify roles and responsibilities in a way that is mutually beneficial for everybody to get the support that they need? One of the biggest things that happens when we think about our ERGs is that we don't often get help. 
right? And that comes from an area of not necessarily having a dedicated resource. You might have a program manager or as myself was a DEI manager for um, my organization, but if you don't have a dedicated like leadership resource or team resource, you really feel like it's all on you. And that's where I would really encourage you to ask for help. It is okay to ask for help, especially if you're experiencing burnout. In the world today, work is back to being the top of everybody's experience, right? Like you spend more than half of your time at work. And to get this weight lifted, you have to know when you need a hand. And I think that sometimes, especially when it comes to populations that often are those overachieving, overextending, because that's how we were raised, right? We have to show up. We have to prove our value. We have to stand up and say, this is something that I can do. So I have to prove it. We end up now that's the expectation because we've shown them that we can do it, that we are capable of doing it. And while that's great, they like us, they respect us. They're like, wow, this work is incredible. We are the ones that are feeling the consequences of that because now we're overwhelmed. We are being burnt out. Um, I mentioned earlier that I started my career in mental health and education. And at first I was like, this is it. This is exactly what I want to do and where I want to be. But after five years in the space, I said, social work is not for me. How can I continue my DEI journey? How can I continue supporting these populations in a different way? Because I was burned out because I was focusing so much time on doing such a great job helping everybody else above myself, overextending to prove that I could do this. And it ended up hurting me in, in more ways than one, not just at work, but at home, my physical ability, my mental capacity, all of these things were affected. So when I moved to a different role, I had to think about what that meant for how I was going to show up, right? It is so hard to get out of that space of saying, I'm an ERG leader and I am this, whatever your profession is, whatever your field is saying, I am both of these things because you are, but you're also a person that has specific needs. We all need to think about how stress impacts us at home. When we leave work, if you're going to bed at night and you can't shut your brain off, cause you're just thinking about this meeting that you have tomorrow and this thing you have to do. And then you're getting home from work at the end of the day. And that's impacting your family and friends because you're, you're, you're withdrawing. You might have an attitude when you're in, engaging in those interpersonal relationships. And then of course, like we talked about just a moment ago with that animosity at work, are you now struggling with finding a connection with certain stakeholders because of this tension of stress, how you're feeling physically, you're tired, you're sore, you're stiff. You just don't want to be here. So making sure that you take care of yourself is the only way you're going to be able to produce this great work in both capacities that you serve for your community and for your organization. A lot of times folks that support ERGs are so focused on their main job and they're so focused on their community support, they don't think about the holistic organizational connection. And that's something that is changing. I think that now that ERGs, BRGs, and other networking groups are becoming the forefront of inclusion at the workplace, we're seeing more of this understanding of the role that they're supposed to play. So I do think there is this perfect time right now for you to say, yes, DEI climate, it's not great, but we're not going anywhere. So, how can we make this easier for us to be able to work in this challenging environment? And that comes with this plan this plan of working together to put all of these things into a perfect package of a program development. Um, we think about resetting everything you've done. That is scary. When I think about um, the Kraft Heinz. BRGs, that was something that it was a challenge. They said, we need a playbook. We need to think about where we're at. We need to reimagine this entire program. How can we do that? And it really came down to developing that strategy. We sat together and we did a listening tour from all different stakeholders, from the organization, from people in our communities, from our BRG leaders to say, 
this is our plan. And we put together an entire playbook. And these are some of the things that are going to be really helpful for you as you think about taking that weight off of your own shoulders to share the responsibility, but feel confident in what it is that you're doing with your community with ease, right? This is something that you shouldn't have to spend extra hours of your day. This should be part of your work day. Um, there's something else that is not typically done in the workplace, especially right now, but it's also making sure that your leadership understands the commitment that this takes. So identifying how much time it's going to take of your schedule to be able to do this during the workday to say, I need you to give me the commitment from the organization to take the time to support this community. So being able to have clarity and, and just transparent conversations conversations with your leadership is really important. Um, with the asking for a helping hand, one of the things that a lot of groups do not think about is leveraging your community. Your entire community, all of your BRG members, ERG members, they might be allies, they might be part of your community, but they're all there for a reason, whether that's support, education, engagement, participation. We usually do not think about the fact that they want to help too. So you can develop committees. You can think about using and leveraging those people to raise a hand to help you execute some of these things, especially when you think about your leadership team can be the ones to develop the plan, right? But now you've got a plan, you've got a timeline, you have roles and responsibilities identified. Let's put that on the people that want to raise their hand to support so it's not just on your shoulders. Again, this is something that as ERG leaders, it's a lot of work to take on in the beginning. When we think about process and procedure development, tracking, planning, metrics, it is a lot of work. And a lot of times this is why we don't do it because it is time consuming. But I promise you in the end, the plan is really going to be what sets you apart. And that's where platforms like Chessy, organizations that help provide visibility to uh, background things, like what we're measuring in the, the KPIs that we've identified for our BRGs, a lot of that can come from your talent management, your data collection, your learning and development, who's getting these experiences and how are we supporting these communities? And those are some of the things that we really encourage you to take on moving forward. So we are going to open up for a Q&A. We wanted to make sure that this session is really high level because the biggest thing that is important for me is being able to bring in the Q&A to hear from you all. Uh, in the past, I've, I've talked to maybe before in making that mistake of saying, here's what I think you should do because I've done this and I know it works, but you all have perspective and insight from your experience at work, your lived experience, your community understanding that the questions you have are going to be more impactful when we can answer them directly instead of coming to you to tell you this is what makes sense. So I want to thank you for your time, but let's open up the floor so that we can we can talk a little bit, um, have a fireside chat and just discuss what it is that's on your mind, where you're struggling when you think about the overwhelm, the stress, the burnout, but also managing the ERGs effectively as well. Thank you, Ashley. And there, yeah, there are a few questions in the chat. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, first one, when seeking out champions throughout the org, are you saying this is above and beyond the executive sponsor partnership? Yes, I do. Absolutely. With um, champions in general, this is something that a lot of folks really lean on a DEI team or a people management team to identify the people that are supposed to, to have this support. However, we found that people that raise their hands because they're passionate about this are going to give you more of a commitment. So while an executive sponsor plays a huge role in giving us the visibility and the influence at that top level of leadership, they give us a lot of approvals that we might not have. Um, having champions sprinkled throughout the organization, they're going to be able to talk to their friends. They're going to share with their team and they're going to be able to kind of help you spread the word, but they're also going to be able to bring in that area of the business. And this is something that 
is a little bit different when we think about like an employee resource group, a networking group, or um, a business resource group. Because a business resource group does have the added responsibility of supporting the organization's development. So they might actually have KPIs and metrics that they're trying to advance for talent representation or um, advancement in uh excuse me, um, promotions and things like that. They might also have a responsibility when it comes to if you're a CPG company or an organization that develops a product, do you now have the perspective and the lens from this other area? So being able to connect with champions throughout the business is going to be very important, but how they interact with you is going to depend on what your roles and responsibilities as an ERG are. Are you just here to serve the purpose of supporting your community? Are you here to educate and create engagement and inclusion? Like if we can identify first what role you play and what your responsibilities are, that's where you'll be able to help find those champions to help you push this inclusive environment and, and kind of change the culture if that makes sense. Awesome. Um, someone asked what happened when, what happens when we've asked for clarity and goals, but have yet to get them after one and a half years, myself and other ERG leaders have had to build the structure process and procedures for the ERGs yet still don't think enough support yet. So don't get enough support. Excuse me. The only leader we get to speak with is the VP of people and culture. Mm hmm yeah, and that is not uncommon, especially when we think about how a lot of DEI spaces have been kind of built into HR, right? So it's like, oh, people, culture, DEI, inclusion, it's all kind of fits in there. And that's where you, I would say, in your specific situation, leaning on your VP of people and culture to say, we need more representation to get the visibility might be the next best step for them to get the influence to identify certain folks that should be involved in understanding what it is that you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it so that they can now help influence this change. If we don't have that executive level leadership buy-in if they're not showing up to our events, if they're not being, if they're not even aware of what it is we're doing, because we don't have that connectivity to them, we're not going to get the support we need. That's just the bottom line. So to get to them, we, we have to be the ones to show it to them. And a lot of that comes with creating that that plan to be able to say, hey, here's a full report of what we did throughout the year. Here's where we succeeded. Here's where we have opportunities to do better. This is what we've tracked and this is where we're impacting. So that's where these champions in other areas of the business can help you get that data, help you understand these metrics to think about proving your value and your worth. And I think it, it's kind of taboo to say like, I shouldn't have to prove the worth of the ERGs. They should get it. They should know why this community is important to the business. But sometimes they don't, because when we think about being in specific types of organizations, their bottom line is the dollar. They're thinking about profit. They're thinking about retention. They're not necessarily thinking about some of these other aspects that we are thinking about. And it's important that they get that. So to connect those dots, Sometimes training is important, but sometimes it comes from a, a storytelling. It comes from your group reaching them to say, you know, we want to host an executive leader uh, learning and development opportunity where we have a storytelling session and we do X, Y, Z to show this. But here's also this five slide deck that shows all that we achieved last year, the successes and the engagement numbers from our members and how they are feeling about our organization organization. So those would be my top recommendations. I think that sometimes we find that we're not going to get what we need and we have to get creative about how we get it. And that could be just saying, you know, we're not going to get the support. We're not going to get the funding. We're not going to get the visibility. So how can we create it ourselves and then track it to prove it in the back end? Yeah, I think data is so important. So thanks for highlighting that. Um, another question in the chat. So I am currently the operations lead for a BRG and I am stressed and overwhelmed. While we have tried to plan in advance, I feel like the planning always falls on me and the excuse is that the other leaders are more senior. How do I overcome that? I think 
One of the challenges when it comes to having multiple leaders on a team is the need to have a structural oversight. So some organizations call it an oversight manager, some a program manager, and sometimes it just sits within people or culture or HR, DE, and I. If we don't have a person that we can go to to say, hey, this is where we're at, sometimes that's where the roles and responsibilities get overloaded and they might not be following through with their responsibilities. So I would say finding someone that you feel like you can confide in that might have some influence in kind of talking through it to say, this is our culture. This is what our expectations are. This person is not necessarily carrying their weight and it's all on me. How do we work together in, especially when it comes to operations, that is something that is very challenging. And so having one person manage it all is, it's aggressive. That is a lot. So I commend you for even taking that on. But I would also say maybe lean into some of the folks in the operations or manufacturing teams to say, can you help? Can you lend a hand, you know, maybe create a smaller committee that can help you develop what needs to happen so that your proactive planning can actually come to fruition? There's always going to be change. And I think a lot of people don't like to think about proactive planning because they're like, well, everything's changing. The business is changing. Our goals are changing. Things are happening. What's the point? The point is, is because even if things are changing, you can still manipulate what you've already put together. And so I would definitely encourage you to try to stick to your plans um, but bring some other people along. If you don't have anybody that you feel like you can safely talk to about how you're feeling overwhelmed and how you don't want to step down, but that you just need a hand, I would say develop a small, maybe four-person committee from your operations manufacturing teams directly and say, hey, I know you always raise your hand to help or you're always showing up at these events or you just seem like somebody who wants to go above and beyond. Like, how can we work together to make sure that you're not doing all of the work, but that this also gives them that empowerment of being able to have a say in what's happening. Um, so that might be helpful for you. One of the things that I also find really helpful is identifying terms for leadership team members. So that means if one person is serving, if you have a, a one-year term, for example, if they've served their term and it's not going well, well, your term's up and now we're bringing somebody else in. But if it is going well, giving them the opportunity to continue on for another year. So identifying these kind of guidelines and how we execute can be really helpful for kind of weeding out people that either are too overwhelmed to manage it so they end up not showing up, right? Because that's something that we just talked about. This could be that, yeah, they're senior and they've got other stuff going on, but they also could be so overwhelmed that this is not the top of their list. So do they need help? Do they need a committee? Do we need more leadership team members? Like how, what do we all need together? And if it's not working, we have guidelines put into place that say, if you're not achieving this, this, and this, you're not doing this job effectively, which means we're going to have to move on to somebody else. Obviously, I, my assumption is that I don't think you have the influence or the authority to make that decision, but being able to influence some other folks that do is really important for an ERG leader in general. Influence is key when we think about getting the supports and resources that we need, whether it's funding, um, resources, people, any of those things. Being able to influence without authority um, is something that I would I would encourage you to look into when it comes to like some learning and development for yourself. Yeah. Question from JB. What would you recommend as a next step for a broad ERG that served as a resource or ag advocacy space for multiple marginalized groups that is now attempting to equip those groups to operate more in their own? Okay. I'm going to read the question just so I understand. I'm going to move it so it's not in your way. Okay. ERG has served as a resource. Okay. All right. So with that one, one of the things that I would recommend is providing them more of those process and procedures, right? You're trying to equip them to be able to do these things without you being like, not necessarily holding their hands, but doing it for them, letting them know that you are a resource, you can give advocacy, but they need to be able to operate singly, singly. 
And one of the ways that you can do that is thinking about some of the models that are out there. There are plenty of organizations that have different models and foundational structures for an ERG or a BRG that says, this is where we are, where we have oversight, we're, you know, we're not responsible for a lot, a lot of things. We just kind of execute after they program and plan. And then the next step is, okay, we handle these things, but we still have this entity that kind of manages us. And then as we move forward, the traditional model that I like is um, uh, Jennifer Brown Consulting. It's a five-step model of foundation where you can think of your ERGs and BRGs in this holistic space to say, oh, we're kind of in the middle as a program, but individually, this one's here, this one's here, this one's here. And that is something I would recommend because it comes with the actual elements of what is expected for those spaces to where you can identify process and procedure, roles and responsibility for that group to say, hey, now we're shifting from here to here where you are now going to be the one that is responsible for X, Y, Z. Coming up with that playbook or a program plan, something that is on paper, even if it's just a one pager to say, this is the next step is what I would do. So I would say, kind of look, look around and find the foundational model that works best for your organization, where you sit currently, but also where you want to be to, to develop that strategy. And then having those, again, it could be five documents that say process and procedure, execution, strategy, expectations, and then they move forward. I also want to encourage you to understand that while there is an expectation for them to be self-sustaining, it might take baby steps, especially because they are also more than likely still working a second job. So I would give yourself grace, but give yourself a timeline of saying, I'm going to help them in this space for this period of time. I'm gonna show them X, Y, Z, but then they're gonna take it over. So kind of identify the, the training process, if you will, for yourself, but also for that commitment so that they understand like, hey, once we did this, it's in your hands now. Uh, the way that I typically like to train is kind of a three-step where I'm gonna show you one time and you're gonna watch me and take notes. The next time you're gonna do it and I'm gonna watch you and help you fill in your notes. And that third time, you're on your own. After that third time, if we need help, if we have questions, totally understandable, but it's yours now. And I'm just here for questions. Thank you. Um, next question. So what recommendations do you have in keeping ERG leaders engaged and uplifted while the DEI team works to get company leadership more on board with DEI in general? For context, this is a small five-year-old company with limited diversity in the first place. Mm, that's a great question. Um, one of the best things that you can do is really working with your group together, supporting each other and helping each other through these things to do what you can. Um, I, I'm not sure if you have a, a budget, an operating budget for your BRGs. But one of the things that I encourage is that if you have an operating budget, make sure you save some of that fun that funding for yourselves, whether that's a team offsite or a learning and development opportunity, a conference, just a lunch or a happy hour, making sure that you are focusing some of your time, attention, and energy on each other. Um, one of the biggest things that happens with an organization that has multiple ERGs or BRGs is that they get siloed. So we're working over here, we're working over here, we're working over here, but we're all doing the same thing just for a different community. You know, it's the same purpose. So making sure that you connect with each other, collaborate with each other for the work, but also on a personal level, you should feel comfortable and confident in going to those other leaders to say, hey, I might need a hand or hey, show me how to do this, but also think of them as, as peers, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you have a great opportunity to consider the fact that you're probably all from different areas of the business. There's limited DEI and support for your community in the first place. So now you can come together as your own community and support each other in that way. That's going to alleviate a lot of the, I want to say the, the feeling of the company not supporting you or not being ready 
to deliver so much support, but that you have each other, you have that community with each other. And you all know that you're going through similar things, especially because you're all ERG leaders. So you're all feeling the same thing. So why not bring that together? Um, when we talk about uplifting in general, a lot of that comes from the communication of what it is they need. Some of them just want recognition. Some of them want monetary or, you know, a gift or whatever it is, but talking to individuals to figure out what their needs are, what their wants are, and how they feel appreciated and supported could be really helpful as a first step and then start to execute. Yeah, I think this next question is probably top of mind for a lot of ERG leaders. So I have found that people love to attend my ERG events, but when I try and get members to engage and actively participate in the planning, marketing, et cetera, of these events, they have no interest. How do I get my members to be more involved? It's exhausting trying to support not only my community, but the communities I serve. That is a great question. And I will say, I think that this goes back to two different things. The first one being kind of planting those champions, identifying people that, you know, maybe in their full-time job, they're a top champion of inclusion or engagement or something like that. So they might have more experience or influence in being able to bring people along, or they might have just a different understanding and perspective of people that they can kind of help you build up the interest and the motivation of the other communities. The other thing that is likely happening is that the sentiment of the culture and the organization might not be where it should be or can be where your members want to attend things, but they don't necessarily feel empowered to actively engage. Maybe that's because they're also overloaded at work and they don't have the time, or maybe it's because they're like, eh, does the company really care? Um, so I would say one of the things that we've done is collect a lot of data specifically from our members to, you know, an anonymous survey sent to your members to say what it is you need. How did this go? Why didn't you participate? Why did you engage in this one? What are some of the stressors you're experiencing as work as a person of color or a member of the LGBTQ plus community? All of these different aspects of just asking them vulnerable, open and honest questions to get that feedback so that you know how to reach them. It is something that um, I think we all experience as ERG leaders and starting to do that in my last organization, we got stuff that we didn't even necessarily think about, right? Like you're kind of in your own world when you're overwhelmed that you're like, this is just what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. But getting feedback and by, uh, excuse me, feedback and like information, that data from those folks who are individually experiencing these things and have these different feelings that we're all also feeling is going to help you kind of know how to reach them in a better way. They're going to start to feel more motivated. They're going to feel more appreciated because you heard them. One of the things that happens a lot of the times when we think about engagement surveys, organizations love engagement surveys, but what do we do with it? What do we do with that information? A a lot of times it's nothing. We don't have the, the time or the money or whatever it is to do something with it. That's the company. That's the business, the organization. You can do the same thing and you can action on those things because you have such a smaller space to impact, but it can be very pointed to say these five people said they wanted X, Y, Z. Let's focus on that. These people said they don't like this and this is why they're not engaging let's address that. And that's when you then take the additional step to find those stakeholders and champions and other areas of the business that can support you in doing these things. One of the uh, elements that happened previously where I had experienced was some of our members saying they weren't getting the right learning and development opportunities from the business that the ERG was providing them, you know, pointed learning and development, like fun speakers and things like that. But the company was not giving this community what they felt they needed to upskill themselves specifically. And that is something that we had to address. But that's not us. We can't do that. So getting the data first to be able to identify what you have to hit and then going into those other spaces to say, this is the feedback we got. This is what our recommendations are. How do we make this happen? I think then you're going to start seeing some more engagement because they feel that commitment. Okay, two more questions to wrap it up. Uh, first is kind of an extension of the last question. So what's the best way to incorporate and foster community-led initiatives instead of ERG leadership-led ones? Um, engagement is challenging at times. 
Yeah, that's a good one too. I think the community-led initiatives can be challenging if you haven't identified committee support or people that are going to raise their hands. It is really going to be on the ERG leaders themselves until you identify kind of a structure or a model of what a committee might look like. And for a smaller group, it might not make sense to have a committee because you can you can kind of manage it. If you've got, you know, 40 people in your group and there's three leaders, I think you'll be okay maybe just getting one other person to raise their hand. But if you've got hundreds or thousands of people you're trying to impact, you need more than three to eight people. Um, so identifying a structure for how you would develop a committee that makes sense with your organization. One of the things that I have done in the past was work with other areas of the business that already had committees. So how are they functioning? How are they structured? What are their responsibilities and who kind of plays what role here? And then kind of adapting that and manipulating it to make sense for us to say, okay, these are the, the roles that we'll have that are slotted into to this committee. These are the expectations. And it's a lot less formal, of course, than a leadership team, but they still have a, a piece of the, the planning or the engagement or whatever it is. And that is also going to give you more uh, engagement when it comes to their friends, their peers, their coworkers and colleagues from their areas of the business. So you'll probably see more attendance and more engagement as well. And one of the things that we notice in general with ERGs and BRGs is when you have a successful event, people talk about it, right? That's how you get to see your numbers climb. Numbers climbing is not important, but the engagement and the sentiment of your numbers is what is important. So if they're expanding because people are talking about how successful it was, that's extremely positive. So starting small, identifying a committee and kind of putting people in those places is where I would begin so that you can start to kind of just spread the word. This is so good. Last question comes from Tatiana. Um, what's advice you would recommend for leaders of interfaith or religious groups that deal with navigating the political climate, external discrimination, that often us leaders within the organization have no control or impact in changing? Yes, that is a very good question to end on. So right now with the climate, um, if your organization does have an interfaith or a religious group, whatever that looks like, a faith-based um, networking situation, the biggest thing that I would recommend is really understanding that remaining neutral is not an option. But when we think about how we approach things and the impact it has on other people, regardless of our intent, that is something that has to be top of mind. So a lot of times that does come with taking on external um, advisory, consulting, or training opportunities to really understand how can we be inclusive, but how can we support without being remaining neutral, but also understanding that the organization may or may not take a stance, but we have a, a commitment and a role to play as this group. When it comes to the organization taking a stance, you don't have to necessarily align with that, but it is very important to make sure that what it is your goals are and what stance your group takes is still considerate of the inclusivity of the overall organization's community, because that's where we see a lot of this conflict to where many organizations are saying, we're not going to have an interfaith or a faith-based um, group because it's dangerous and it can be too, too much for people to handle at times. But now that a lot of people are considering their religion in a way that brings out who they are as a person, right? We think about values, we think about how we see the world in perspective and things like that. That does translate into how you work, how you engage and interact and things like that. So navigation with other communities would be something that I would recommend when it comes to bringing in that holistic understanding. Again, outside of the external coming in to kind of give you a little bit more training on how to be inclusive without 
how to remain true to your values while still being inclusive, but also bringing in the perspective from those other folks could be really helpful for your group to understand, like, we're not going to have a debate. This is not a discussion. We're going to have a learning event where we're going to hear from this community. Um, something that I was one of the best things that I ever experienced in my life was attending a non-denominational church. And the reason why was because we were able to learn about every single religion and community experience. And this was not just religious aspects, but also just um, all sorts of different spiritualities, different lived experiences, the LGBTQ plus community. We had to learn from them. Each week it was something different, but then those people also got to speak to the congregation. We would have things like uh, a Seder dinner, but then we would also have a Christmas ceremony and then we'd have a flower communion, you know? So being able to experience the perspective from all of these different communities and again, bring bringing up that storytelling could be helpful for your group specifically to understand the perspective of others, but also give back to the way that they experience this climate right now to say, we hear you, we support you, we're empathetic to your cause, we still have our values, but we are inclusive and kind of sharing with each other, knowing that, again, you have very similar goals and very similar experiences, just a different perspective of it. And so how do we share that perspective with each other for kind of this mutual understanding and respect? Awesome. That is a great way to close us out. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. I will be sending out the recording and Ashley's information in a follow-up, but Ashley, I'll give you the final words. Thank you. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, I just remembering that leading an entire community of people who feel and experience work and life the same way that you do, it's a huge responsibility. But doing it with joy and confidence and excitement is really going to be what helps you succeed. So being able to think about the, the stressors that you're experiencing both inside and outside of work is going to be the first thing that you should do. Really just self-reflect, identify what is triggering you, what is causing all of this pain so that you can start to address it and assess it. For ERG specifically, coming up with that plan and identifying how you move forward is, it's a big step, but you can do it. You can absolutely do it. And you have organizations like Chezzy, myself, people that can come in and help you do these things. So don't feel discouraged, keep your motivation up and lean on each other. Developing an ERG community of leaders, do it, trust me. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Take care.